part one, it has to do with funding, and that's true for most documentaries. This, uh, we got some small grants, but you know, it's mostly self-funded, you know, a lot of free labor, etc. So it just takes longer because you have to squeeze your work into the margins of your regular jobs, right? Your regular life, yeah. And then the other reason was really, when we say six years, the first year or two was really getting to know people and kind of developing these uh, relationships of trust that they would even be willing to be filmed. So and it took a long time to develop that. Can you describe how it is you did get to know these uh, folks who became the focal point, the four survivors that you uh, zeroed in on in your film? How did that happen? I think we met each one of these people in, in different ways. The um, we first approached the Kovla Center, and they were wonderful. They, you know, they vetted us. They uh, invited people to meet with us as a big group, and we pitched the idea. And most of the people in the room said, "Great idea, but I could never participate in something like this." And then from there, it took maybe a year or so that one or two people in that group said, "I will. I'm comfortable being part of this." And I think. Part of it is also that we didn't just want to make an interview-based film. So it wouldn't be just a one-time meeting, we do an interview and it's over, but we really want to immerse ourselves a little bit more fully into their lives. So we would create a holistic portrait of the people in the film. So they're not just labeled victims, but they're people with a full range of activities and, and you know, uh, be it leisure time, work, relationships and so on, because we felt if we had, a, had the viewer encounter a more personal uh, relationship with the people who are portrayed in the film, it would create a, a deeper experience and also people could more identify better with who they're seeing on screen. In fact, I mean, even once we selected and uh, we had the survivors agree to participate in the film, even then it was a very <clears throat> slow going process in terms of building trust during the course of our filming with them. <clears throat> so in the beginning, Inez and I were even a little bit afraid to ask certain questions. Because it's a very, it's a painful topic. And we knew that by them retelling their stories, this could also re-trigger certain symptoms in them. These are not easy stories to convey. So in the beginning, we were a little bit timid. As time went on, we, and we got to know them, and they got to know us better, our, inter our questions became more pointed, and we went deeper, and they trusted us enough to also be able to go deeper into their stories. But so basically you were involved with these, the, these particular subjects for several years. That's right. And, and to go back to your earlier question, some of the other people we found through other treatment centers. There's a very good one in Los Angeles and one in Minneapolis. So they made introductions for us. And then the story of uh, Don Vance was actually in the news. And we had read about it and we reached out to Don. Now that, that yes, I had heard of Don Vance. And if you want to talk about his issue in case the, our listeners don't recall what, his, what happened, Don? Don Vance was a, as a U.S. Navy veteran, and he became a uh, military contractor when he went to Iraq 2004-2005. And while he was there, he discovered or became aware of certain shady dealings going on in terms of trading arms and that type of thing. And he became a whistleblower, essentially, and he informed the FBI stateside as to what he was witnessing. And some of what he was witnessing involved government officials as well in Iraq, American government Someone officials. in the State Department, I believe your film says, yeah. So he Very informed the FBI, and uh, before he knew it, he was, I mean, there were other circumstances that came up, I won't go into the details now, but before he knew it, he and his colleague were taken into custody by the U.S. military and uh, blindfolded and taken to Camp Cropper in Iraq where they were detained without due process, without access to a lawyer for four months and experienced various forms of torture like sensory deprivation, um, deprivation of food, deprivation of medical care. Um, not, a pretty, not a pretty picture. Um, one, one, of the, one of the other, and I am sort of just going through the, uh, some of the people that you feature that you did manage to become close to, close enough to to make this film, which is apparently quite difficult, was uh, Blama Masakwi. Uh, he was a Liberian child soldier initially. Um, he was the easiest, I, you know, to empathize with, but that's because he had outward scars of what happened to him. Um, but he was still dealing 
I mean, how many years had he been in the States and he had been getting surgeries and was on all kinds of medications and was trying to integrate into society for several years? I mean, Lana was tortured when he was 15 years old and he's in his early 20s now, so it's at least seven or eight years now and it will be a lifelong medical condition that he carries with him. Right. Um, just to explain what happened with him, he was sort of uh, inducted drafted against his will in Liberia to become a child soldier. He was basically kidnapped off the, off the streets as he's walking home from a school assignment. He gets kidnapped by Charles Taylor, who was the dictator in Liberia at the time, by his military, uh, forced to become a child soldier. I, th I think Blama resents the term child soldier because he really didn't do anything. It happened pretty quickly that then a rebel group snatched him and uh, another group of kids and they were tortured by forcing them to drink some chemical substance which is most likely like lye. So uh, several of the other kids died and uh, Blama's esophagus was destroyed. So he was in hospitals in Africa for years. And then uh, some groups in Minnesota sponsored uh, him to come to uh, Minnesota and he ultimately got surgery at the Mayo Clinic and they've done an incredible job but he still, you know, has to be very careful, is very prone to infections. They did uh, reconstructive surgery for him and so on. So it's something that he's going to carry for his entire life. Well, isn't that the case with, with all forms of torture? It's uh, akin to any kind of assault. Uh, we certainly know sexual assault victims have to do major repairing of themselves to get back into their, who they are, if uh, even a repaired self. Um, but the, the child soldier concept, it, it's so widespread in Africa, the kidnapping of young kids, the, the Lord's Resistance Army, who, um, was it Rush Limbaugh, made the incredible, uh, wonderful error of, of uh, criticizing um, the president for, work, uh, for mounting some sort of uh, uh, offense, offensive against the people who were the Lord's Resistance Army. And, the, you know, Limbaugh assumed since Lord was in it, it must be a good, good God-fearing people. And he had to, he said, why would we go against the Lord's resist? Because they are incredibly bad and they're killing people and they're, they're uh, kidnapping all these kids. The other part that um, you said he shouldn't be called a child soldier, um, um, is that because he didn't wind up having to partake in... Uh, uh, soldierly I I, activities? I just said that because Blama himself really doesn't like to be labeled that way. Clearly, okay. So it's not so much something Because it's a double trauma in their situation. Mm -hmm. They not only are kidnapped and tortured and, and abused and uh, everything, but they are also abusing and torturing themselves eventually to other people. So it's, it's this double tragedy. Uh, and I don't know how you rebuild a person after not only experiencing it themselves, but then laying it on other people. Uh, it's huge, it's huge, and the work that these centers do is so important. Yeah, and rebuilding their lives is very much what this film is about. I mean, we've used the terminology during the course of this interview as victims. They do not like to be seen as victims because the, the path that they have ahead of them in terms of countering this life sentence of the trauma that they experience is daunting. I, when I think of what they need to do as individuals, all four of the survivors in our film, just in order to cope with life, let alone advance in life, and it's absolutely daunting given what they've been through and having to rebuild their sense of trust in, in humankind. Well, it also, what to me was really interesting about your film was the fact that it addresses the fact about, of, of identity, that basically the torture sort of destroys their identity. They have to create almost a new identity because that person doesn't exist anymore after that event or those events. It's yeah. multiple. The, uh, Dr. Mary Fabri in our film, who is the director of the Marjorie Culver Center, uh, has said that one of the most painful things for her to hear, to hear when she's in therapy with the survivors is for them, for them to say they wish they, they, they could be the person that they were. And she knows that that will never be. And that's something happen. that has to be accepted. Um, we're talking to Kathy Berger and Ines Summer, uh, co-directors of Beneath the Blindfold. It's a human rights documentary about uh, torture victims and, uh, and I guess they are sort of activists in a way because just by virtue of being in this film. I think it 
several of them have already been involved in uh, speaking out against torture, but I think the film will give them an even greater platform. And the film is about torture survivors, but it's also about healing, and it's about uh, regaining agency and reclaiming your voice. And in some way, we hope that the film ends on a somewhat hopeful note, because it shows how community can help people rebuild or create a new identity and how supportive that can be. What's the biggest misconception that uh, folks who have no contact with these stories uh, have when they hear the word torture or torture victims? What do you find is the biggest ignorance that we all hold vis-a-vis uh, -vis that topic, if you can? I love it when I ask a question and, a and there's silence. silence. Yeah. That's good. I think I hesitated because I think there's misinformation on a number of levels. I think there's misinformation in the way that um, people understand what torture is, that torture can be effective, that, and it, it can't. I don't believe it, it, it's actually useful. That was that, also that, addressed in your film, just the whole notion that, well, we, it's, it's effective and, and, and so sometimes it's okay to use it. And that it's useful in terms useful. of protecting our national security, which... When in fact it's been shown that it is not. Exactly. I think it doesn't make any of us more safe. Um, Quite the opposite. And I think also we think in terms of torture as having only a physical dimension. If it's not physical torture, it's not torture, and that's absolutely not true. There are many different levels of torture. I mentioned earlier sensory deprivation is a form of torture. Well, you showed some very interesting fo film footage from, from the 50s where all they did was wrap somebody up and, you know, so they couldn't feel themselves and had, you know, uh, basically just, they weren't physically harmed, but they were sort of cocooned in such a way that they couldn't hear, see, whatever. And within 24 to 48 hours, they were having complete identity breakdowns. I mean, that's all it took. And that's not waterboarding, that's not... You know, it's amazing. No, no physical scars, right? It's just exactly. manipulating the psyche. And just think what happens to people in solitary confinement. I, I think when viewers see the film, they can draw all kinds of conclusions as to what we're doing in our penal system. Um, you know, what was done in Chicago under Bridge. You know, that could have easily been part of this film as well. And I should note, our film premieres on January 13th. And just the day before, uh, Alderman Joe Moore, who is Roger Park, Rogers Park's uh, alderman, will uh, present, a present to the city council a resolution to make Chicago a torture-free city. And that's sponsored by the Illinois Coalition Against Torture. So we feel it's a really, the, this upcoming week is a really strong week for people to learn more about what the issue of torture is, how it might have happened in their own communities, to, to learn more to come to our screening, to go to our website, which is beneaththeblindfold.org. So I hope people take this opportunity. Um, beneath the Blindfold, people that are um, listening to the show right now, you have the opportunity to see this film um, this next Friday, January 13th at 8.15 at the Gene Siskel Film Center, which is part of the Art Institute of Chicago. Now, you're going to have a reception before the screening at 6.30, and I assume that means you get to, you know, if, if we show up, we get to talk to the filmmakers. Sure, we'll do that. <laughs> and that we'll also have on hand uh, people from our film. So a couple of oh. the survivors in our film will be there as well for a Q&A after the panel discussion. And I should also mention, if you can't make the 13th, there's an encore screening on the 18th. 18th. 19th. Thank you. 19th. Sorry, 19th. 19th. Uh, again, at the Gene Siskel at Center. Siskel. Okay. And well, we do have a website for people if they'd like to learn more information about this project. It's www.beneaththeblindfold.org. All right. Uh, Kathy and Inez, just fi one final question. Um, did making this film enter your own psyches? Did you have dreams? Did you find yourself off kilter? Or were you able to uh, maintain some sort of distance? That's the first part. And the second part, uh, what's your next project? <laughs> Okay, it was actually not as difficult to make the film in terms of the, like, you know, feeling psychologically traumatized. I felt so grateful to the people who were willing to be part of the film that that was a much more overriding 
element for me, and I feel I learned so much from them. You know, I had a lot of preconceptions going into making the documentary, and I love it when you're a documentarian, when you learn that you're wrong, <laughs> that you have to really adjust what your film says as you're making it. So one example would be uh, both Kathy and I thought, oh, people who were tortured for political reasons probably heal faster because they have their whole political, you know, conviction to, to back the them up. And that's not true. So to just learn those kinds of things was really very enlightening. I, I agree with Inez. Uh, I mean, there were some stories that were difficult and painful to heal, but we became very close with most of the survivors that we worked with. When I would tell friends what I'm working on, they would say, like you, oh, you better be careful, protect yourself, this is a very depressing topic. But more than anything, I really felt inspired by the people that we worked with. It's an, it's an inspiring story. The film is not as depressing as one no. might think. There are uplifting moments in it. There are subtle messages there about how these people are not defeated, despite what they've been through. So there are absolutely inspiring messages, and the people we worked with are inspiring people. Well, that's a great note to uh, finish the interview on. This is called Be Beneath the Blindfold, and it premieres in Chicago next Friday the 13th. At, uh, the showing starts at 8.15 on that night. If you're not available that night, the second showing is uh, January 19th, which I think is uh, Thursday, yeah, at Gene Siskel downtown. Get off at the State, Street, State and Lake exit, and you're right there. Um, Thanks so much for coming on today. Stay in touch because you do really good work. And uh, keep on keeping on. Thanks Thank so you much. for coming. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, let's hear it for Beneath the Blindfold, Inez Summer and Kathy Berger. Uh, thanks, Lisa Smith, for coming back and uh, doing the interview, setting it up. Be careful that step down off this new funky.